Nice to see you this morning at this uh, all-age service. Uh, as you probably guessed by looking at the balloons all around, we're going to be talking about balloons. And one kind in particular, we're going to be talking about hot air balloons. Uh, a few years ago, Roger and I had a, a holiday in Egypt. We had a, a cruise down the River Nile. Mm, hence my scarf from Egypt. Um, and uh, we had the opportunity when we were there of going up in a hot air balloon and flying over the, uh, the, the Nile and the Valley of the Kings. Uh, but we declined it. And I'm very glad because the following week, one of those very balloons crashed just where we'd been walking uh, in the Valley of the Kings. But I've been, um, I've been thinking since then about hot air balloons, and the, there's absolutely lots of, of comparisons between the journey you take in a hot air balloon and our Christian journey and our walk with God. So today, I'm going to share with you a modern-day parable all about the, uh, the, diff, the relationship comparisons between having a, a journey in a hot air balloon and our Christian walk with God. I've called it Up, Up and Away, just in case you want a title. And if the children want to draw, the, on the, the big table at the back, there is paper and pencils, and if you want to draw me a, a hot air balloon, you know, high up in the sky, we'll have a look at them later. Now, thinking about our experience uh, when we were in Egypt, and maybe you've had bad experiences too, or heard of bad experiences of going up in one of these contraptions, it would be very wise to ask lots of questions before you go. And the men, in particular, might want to check their health insurance or update their will or something like that. But if it was me, I would ask myself various questions. First of all, do I really want to go up in this hot air balloon? I've got a poor head for heights. I don't even like walking over swing bridges, as Roger would tell you. I get dizzy. So I would be quite scared at the thought. So that's my first question. Do I really want to do this? And then, how does it work? Can I trust it? Um, Roger is a scientist, not me. I know hot air rises, but that's it. That, how it works, I, ju I just don't know. And then, most important of all, I would say, I would ask, can I fall out? And it's a really genuine question, isn't it? Can I fall out? How high are the sides? How strong are they? Do they tie you in? Or do they give you a parachute? So I would examine it, and I'd walk around it, and I'd sit in it, and I'd say, are there any holes? Because I'm not very big. So I could easily slip through. And then I'd want to know about the pilot. Who is he? Do I know him? Is he experienced? Has he done it before? Has anybody recommended him? Can he fly it? Most importantly, can he bring it down? And it's only then, when I've asked all these questions and I've got a satisfactory answer, that I think, OK, I'll do it, I'll go. But it would take an act of faith on my part to commit to that journey. Just as you need an act of faith to commit to that journey, you need an act of faith to commit to the Christian journey, asking God into your life. And that's the beginning of my parable, because just as you would ask a lot of questions before you climb into a hot air balloon, it's wise to ask a lot of questions before you commit yourself to a, a similar journey, but with God. But instead of saying, can I trust hot air to get me up and the pilot to get me down. Some of the questions are similar. Do I want to go on this journey and ask God into my life? 
more fundamentally, uh, do I believe in God? Does he exist anyway? And if he does, can I trust him with my life? All Christians quote Bible verses. We just can't help ourselves. But it's no use quoting scripture to people that don't believe that God exists. Lots of people would say they do believe there is a God. They look around from nature and, you know, just looking around saying, yes, they, they do believe in God. Look at the skies. You have to believe that God exists. But they've never read the Bible. They've never gone to church. They don't know anything about God and they certainly don't follow him. There's a story about a man called Frank Morrison who, who didn't believe. And he set out to disprove the resurrection. Not only did he end up proving it, but he wrote a book about it that, that you can still read today. Uh, I think, uh, Who Moved the Stone, it's called. Very good book, too. But if you read the Bible with an open mind, if you come to God with an open mind, you discover that it's all about how much God loves you, how Jesus died for you, how he took our place and our punishment so that we could go scot-free. And Christians do quote verses, and a popular one is John 3.16, which I'm sure everyone knows. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Whoever believes will have everlasting life. One I like is John 14.6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Jesus is the way, and he's the only way to find God. But there are other questions that you would ask as well. As before, why should I go on this journey? I'm content to stay as I am. I have everything I need. I don't need God. I can manage by myself. Other people are they're wavering, not sure. They don't want to lose control of their lives. They say, if I go on this journey with God, if I commit myself to God and ask God into my life, what do I have to give up? What will it cost me? How will my lifestyle have to change? What rules must I keep? Many think they don't need God in their life. So much to worry about today. Life isn't easy. It's getting harder. You know, today, the, the cost of living and what's happening in Ukraine worries us. And as we discovered today, technology <laughs> is a problem. It's a big problem with me, technology. Another thing that bothers me is this woke generation. Nothing's as simple as it once was. Today, I can call myself, I think, male, female, they. I can describe myself as gender fluid or non-binary. I don't know what these things mean, by the way. Um, I can be a he, she, it, they. You need God. We all need God in our lives. We need God's word because through God's word, we will find the truth and he will guide us on the right way. And we need other people alongside us. And as to the question, what must I give up if I follow God? You don't have to give up anything. But you may want to. However, you always get back much more than you give up. And rules. Do I keep rules? You need rules. Rules. You need boundaries. You need... Um, absolutes to live by. It gives you peace. And as to those people that say, well, I will follow God, but not yet. I'm too young. Maybe when I'm older. I, you know, mañana, that's what the Spanish say, isn't it? Mañana, tomorrow. I admire your confidence. Who knows what mañana will bring? Strangely, it's only after you become a Christian, when you've asked God into your life, that the scales do fall from your eyes and you see that it is all really true. Because God waits for you 
to make the first move because it shows faith that you believe in him. And then he acts and reveals himself to you. That's the way it is. And what about the pilot? Before we said, can you trust him? Can he fly it? Does he know the way? And now the parable on our Christian journey is Jesus is the way. He's our pilot. Yes, we can trust him. Yes, he knows the way. And we can follow him. He knows the best route to take and how to get us there and how to get us back. Now, back to this hot air balloon. Those who've decided, yes, they're going to climb it. They're going to fly in it. So you get in, and you're going to trust it, and you sit there. But you'll never, ever leave the ground. Can any of the children tell me what you need to get up? Or anyone else? What about hot air? Fuel. Power. In this case, it comes from a gas cylinder, I think. You, you write the gas and the hot air goes up in the balloon and up it goes. You could sit for a million years and it would never move if you didn't have hot air or a source of fuel. It's like me in the morning needing coffee to get going. Um, it's just the same in the Christian life. You need a source of power to get you going, to get you airborne. But this time, the source of power is God himself, who comes and indwells you as his Holy Spirit when you become a Christian and fills you with energy. God empowers you, because you can't do this journey by yourself. Just as it was impossible to get the balloon off the ground, so only by asking God to fill you with his Holy Spirit can you get airborne and start the journey. But even when you've got in, and the balloon is full of hot air, strangely, you won't move an inch. There's still something else. There's still something wrong. There's something you've got to do. Because fastened to the sides of the basket are bags of sand. And they're deliberately there to weigh you down, to keep you on the ground. Otherwise, while this balloon is being filled up, it would drag you along with it <coughs> And the, the, the weight is to keep you still. Not what you planned, I'm sure. They've got to be thrown out. Just the same in our Christian journey. We come with a lot of baggage from the past. Shame, guilty consciences, unforgiveness. It's all got to go. We need to acknowledge this to say we're sorry, ask for forgiveness and then move on. Satan wants you to hang on to all this rubbish. He wants to keep you grounded, but you've got to dump it, and then you'll feel so much lighter and ready to, to go on this journey. So that's it. We're off. We're moving. Are we? No, not just yet. We're still only hovering a few feet above the, gr the place where, where you were. That's because you're tethered by ropes guy ropes, as well as these sandbags, there are guy ropes that need to be let go. And these are essential. Otherwise, when you drop the sandbags, you'll, you'll shoot up in the air like a cork from a champagne bottle, join the stars. Or um, I've, You've seen all these balloons all around. I bet some of you have blown one up and pinched the top and let it go. Uh, I'm sure the adults have. I think the children are too well behaved. But if you do, it goes all over the place, hits the ceiling, bang, bangs down on the floor. It's great fun. So these ropes have to be let go very carefully. And then you can say, Houston, we have liftoff. We're going up. Now, back to that thought of the parable. It's the same in the Christian life. We have ropes, guy ropes, keeping us back from moving far. And often these are legitimate things. We all need to go to work. 
uh, we all need to live, we all need time to relax. But the saddest thing to me is that many Christians are content just, just to hover, just off the ground but not moving far. They're content to know that they're saved, they're going to heaven, it's like an insurance policy, but it's not enough. There is just so much more. It's not easy to let go of ropes. But God knows your heart and your circumstances. He knows when you can and what you can't let go through, no fault of your own. But he is looking for people who hunger for more in the Christian life, who want to walk closer, to go deeper or, or higher in this case. Um, you yeah, might have to make sacrifices, but God knows all about sacrifices. In fact, the, the Bible says, they that honor God, he will honor. It also says that he's no man's debtor, and you'll always get back more than you give. So you need to ask yourselves, is there anything I can let go of so that I can climb a bit higher? And it's going to be a different answer for every one of us. It might be a matter of degree as you examine your lifestyle. Try and get that right balance. Well, we're off. We're up there, and we're flying high. I'm sure the pilot will have checked in advance the weather forecast. It found the strength and the direction of the wind. He's got his maps out to find a safe place to land ahead, going with the wind, not against it. Because the pilots choose the height, you, you set the right height safely, but it's the wind that determines the speed and the direction that you go. If you want to go higher, you just let up more hot air. But you have no choice in the direction. You can tweak it a little bit, but you can't go against the wind or you'll crash. Hot air balloons have no brakes. And they have no steering wheels. You're at the mercy of the wind and trust in the pilot's skill. But what of you when you're up there? I say that though I've never been up. <laughs> but I imagine what of you you would get, a bird's eye view of everything. Oh, you see all the beauty of the hills and the trees and the rivers and valleys, the patchwork of fields. Might be a bit scary at times. But you're very visible. They often go over our house and we look up and watch them. They've got this great big advert on them. Um, it's the same in the Christian life. We are just as visible to others. People are watching us, and we're like that big advert for Christ. But just like before with the balloon, it's the same in our Christian life. You choose the height, but God chooses the speed and the direction that you go. You can climb higher, but this time your fuel is prayer. But God chooses your speed and your direction. Try going against it, and you may be, might be swallowed by a whale. The funny thing is, you always end up in the right place at the right time. Even when you think, it's too fast or too slow. I mean, look at our struggle as a church to find a building. It's exactly the right building, exactly the right time. There's a lovely verse in Nehemiah. It says, God has a plan and a purpose for us, to prosper us and not to harm us, to give us hope and a future. And that is just so true. So once you're flying high, you marvel at all you see, and life is so good and exciting. You see the horizon where heaven and earth meet. That's our motto. Touching heaven, changing earth becomes a reality. You can fly over mountains, overcome all obstacles, because nothing is impossible with God. And you can see the way ahead so clearly. And importantly, you can see that you have actually moved you're not still hovering just a few feet off the ground where you set off. You have let go of the guy ropes, and that's reassuring. Even if you've only moved a little bit, you're making progress, so take heart. 
And up there, you get to know the pilot really well. You spend a lot of time with him. In mo both cases, he's with you all the time, and I bet you're glad of that. He doesn't bail out. And whatever obstacles are ahead, he'll stay close. In fact, he's anticipated them before you. There will be difficulties on this Christian journey. We've not been promised an easy life, and you won't always be popular. There's work to do. But this journey is always better with others. I don't know if any of the children at the back did draw a hot air balloon, but I hope they've drawn a picture of themselves in it. It's, it's really good, and they're friends. It's really good when you're traveling with others. But to start the journey, that decision is yours alone. Sadly, every journey must come to an end. Even my parable. Balloons must come down to the ground, sometimes with a bumpy landing. The journey is over. You climb out of the basket, you walk away, and you leave it behind. Our journey on earth must also come to an end one day. For me, fast approaching middle age, it might be sooner than others. <laughs> but one day, we will leave this body behind and walk away. Does the fear of dying keep you awake at night? Are you afraid of the unknown? Or are you still so young you can't be bothered to think about it? One day, though, life will come to an end, and it might be a bit bumpy. Can't guarantee a safe landing. But just as we climb out of that basket that carried us up in the air, so we climb out of this body that's carried us on earth so well, we no longer need it. As we step out, we're just as fully conscious as we were when we were in it. The real living you doesn't die. Just changes direction, changes address. We'll soar on wings like eagles to a new destination, to a place God has prepared for us, where we'll see him face to face, explore the wonders of heaven, a place where there's no more pain, no more sadness, no more sorrow, no more sickness, no more crying, to a place where heaven and earth have met, a place of celebration and worship. I think dying is going to be the most exciting day of my life. I mean that. It'll bring sadness at leaving people and those that are left behind. It'll bring great joy at reunions. And I hope it isn't too bumpy. But I have no fear whatever. So, what stage of this journey are you on? Have you started it? Why not? Are you still asking questions? Well, ask them. Are you carrying dead weight and you can't get going? Or you're tied down? Or you're flying high or are you near the end of the journey? I'm sure of one thing. Once you start this journey with God, a safe journey's end is guaranteed.